Good evening and welcome everyone to the first event of 2022 and of our new Jesus Futures series, The Future of Ethics and AI is tonight's program. Tonight we are joined by Professor Sir Nigel Shadbolt and Professor John Tasoulis, and it is my great pleasure to introduce you to our guest speakers. After beginning his academic career with a double first in psychology and philosophy from the University of Newcastle and a PhD from the University of Edinburgh, Sir Nigel has filled a range of roles in both the public and private sectors. This list includes the Alan Standen Professor of Intelligent Systems at the University of Nottingham, Professor of Artificial Intelligence at the University of Southampton, Information Advisor to the UK Government, and Chair of the Open Data Institute, which he co-founded with Sir Tim Berners-Lee. He is a Fellow of the Royal Society, the Royal Academy of Engineering, and the British Computer Society. He became the Principal of Jesus College in 2015. He is a Professor in the Department of Computer Science, where he leads the Human-Centered Computing Group, and he's also heavily involved in the setting up of the new Institute for Ethics in AI at Oxford. Professor Tasoulis joined the Institute for Ethics in AI in October 2020 as its director, also holding the post of Professor of Ethics and Legal Philosophy in the Philosophy Faculty. He was previously Chair of Politics, Philosophy and Law at King's College London. He is also a Distinguished Research Fellow in the Oxford Uhuru Center and Emeritus Fellow of Corpus Christi College. His research interests include the philosophy of human rights, democracy, punishment, the ethics of AI, and the philosophy of international law. A very warm welcome to you both. And now over to you, Sir Nigel. Thank you very much, Brittany. And it's great to be uh, kicking off this series and uh, welcome to all of the attendees. So uh, John and I thought the best way to organize this would be to really to have a conversation between the two of us and then actually give quite a lot of time over to questions uh, to uh, um, from the audience. We'd be keen to uh, uh, devote quite a, a lot of tonight's uh, discussion to that. So do feel free to pose questions in the chat. And I'm going to just start the conversation with John, just reflecting really on, um, well, AI is very much um, a current topic, although I'm always keen to point out it's it, it's a term that was christened uh, in 1956 by uh, at the Dartmouth Conference in the US, and Alan Turing was talking about machine intelligence in the 40s. I mean, this is a, a subject with a, a lot of history and a lot of accomplishments, but it seems to be particularly um, important at the moment because I think it's understood to be very consequential in the technologies in our lives, on our phones, uh, in the algorithms that are used to make decisions about us. So, so John, actually, it'd be very interesting perhaps to begin by saying, how do you find yourself um, director of the Institute? And then we'll perhaps recap, recapitulate a little bit of the, about the history of the Institute. Um, thank you so much, Nigel. I guess you know the full answer to that because you appointed me, but I can just say something <laughs> about the background. Full so disclosure, my, yeah. My background um, is in law and philosophy where I did undergraduate degrees in those subjects in Melbourne and then came as a Rhodes Scholar to Oxford to work on the topic of ethical relativism. So in a sense, can there be universal ethical standards? Then gradually as I went on in my career, I became more interested in more sort of substantive ethical questions. I mean, you know, Aristotle's advice is don't try to tackle these substantive questions until you're, after, until you're 30 or above in age, because you need practical experience in order to address them. So I kind of implicitly followed that advice and started working on topics like human rights, punishment, and theory of international law. And then it was whilst I was a visiting fellow at uh, the Radcliffe Institute at Harvard, which is an amazing place because it brings together people from many different disciplines and also people who are artists and novelists, um, that I really started discovering, thanks to another fellow who was there, Francesca Rossi, and she's a, one of the leading computer scientists working on AI, that there was a really important ethical dimension to um, AI driven technology and that it intersected in various ways with a lot of things that I was concerned with because 
a lot of the issues that one is interested in in ethics and legal philosophy relate to justified decision making. And if you think about why we value distinctively human beings, it's the capacity for rational decision making that on mo most accounts is at the heart of that. And this is you know, individual decision making um, affecting your own life. It's collective decision making in a political context. And now suddenly with AI, we have a technology that can take decisions. Mm -hmm. And that really poses interesting questions in terms of how we integrate that with our own decision making in a way that doesn't undermine our dignity. So it I thought it was a kind of natural continuation of these themes with the extra um, element that there is a sense now that artificial intelligence is taking off and is likely to be incredibly consequential across a broad range of the aspects of human life. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, though, because in a sense, algorithms that make decisions for us and, are, and, and about us have been around for a long time. I mean, and as I say, AI itself, I remember when I first went up to Edinburgh to begin my uh, PhD, in, what, in 78 um there was uh, well they, they were actually desperately trying to close down ai at the time in the uk because sir james lighthill lucasian professor of mathematics at cambridge decided it was all a lot of bunkum uh, but uh, a few centers survived in the uk and thrived and, and edinburgh was one of them and at that point a little later uh, japanese launched this initiative called the fifth generation computing initiative uh, the Brits thought that Japanese robots would put us all out of work, so we launched a thing called the Alvi program, and we were build, building expert systems at the time, so-called automated decision support systems. And of course, there were ethical questions there. There were questions of, uh, was it appropriate to have these systems uh, making decisions about creditworthiness or about a medical diagnosis? In a sense, do you think the sorts of ethical questions, I'm sure we'll be talking about later, change qualitatively from what they would have been 30 years ago, or is it essentially the same sorts of challenges, just we're now dealing with a different technology implementation, perhaps? Well, that's a really good question, Angela. Can I just take a step back a little bit and just say a little bit about what I take an ethical question to be? Because I think this is a great source of um, confusion. Um, a lot of people think that if we talk about the ethics of AI, we're talking about a form of regulating AI, one form amongst others, that it's a form of regulating AI that is basically soft regulation, self-regulation, that doesn't involve legal regulation, doesn't involve formal sanctions and enforcement mechanisms. So I just want to be clear that that is not how we understand ethics of AI in the Institute that has been recently created at Oxford. That's one form of regulation amongst others. We understand it as a mode of thinking that is foundational to all forms of regulation. So even if you're talking about hard regulation through law, you still have to address ethical questions. And the way I would sort of crudely for these purposes summarize what ethical questions are is that they have two dimensions. One is an aspect of what is it to live a flourishing life? So it's basically about what a fulfilling human life is where we realize our potentialities, we fulfill our basic interests. And the other aspect, the more moral aspect, what is it that we owe to other people? So that's why we have an Institute for Ethics and AI because those questions are absolutely foundational. Um, no matter what kind of regulation you're then thinking about implementing. So to your question though, Nigel, um, have those questions changed? I think they change in two ways. So one is the more you deploy AI systems, you're deploying them across a broader range of human activity. And I think what we have to realize is there's a different profile of value depending upon which domain of activity you're talking about. So the relevant sort of profile of values in healthcare isn't quite the same as the relevant profile of values in something like the justice system, the criminal justice system. 
So whether it's appropriate to use an algorithm and in what way it's appropriate to use that algorithm, there will be different considerations in play, which is one of the reasons it's important to recognize that um, you need to have people who are ethical experts all right, but usually that ethical expertise will be keyed to certain domains of activity. It's much harder to say, well, I'm an ethical expert on AI across the board of all AI activity. Going that way, I think, risks a kind of superficiality. So that's one way I think there's been a difference because of the more pervasive character of AI's intervention in our ordinary lives. But the other way in which I would say there's a difference is the different kind of AI technology that has emerged. So if you were talking about good old fashioned AI, which is about trying to distill, as it were, the principles on the basis of which ordinary humans make decisions and sort of embody them in some automated system. But with machine learning, it doesn't work like that. And so that raises distinctive problems, I think, especially problems of explainability, where you might say, well, okay, maybe it is arriving at the correct decision, but is it arriving at the correct decision in a way that can be explained to the person subject to that decision? Yeah. And again, that point feeds back to the initial point, explainability itself will vary in significance depending upon which domain of activity we're talking about. It might be particularly important that we're able to explain to someone we're about to sentence to a long-term imprisonment the basis on which this decision was made. In other areas, we might be more content with good outcomes and not so concerned about explainability. Right, yeah. So, so I'm just thinking about that I mean, uh, we'll probably touch on this. I, I, I think we might just, before we go further, perhaps talk about the, the genesis of, of the Institute and, and how it's landed up in Oxford in the way it, it has. And of course, uh, this goes back to a, um, a donation made uh, to uh, the university by Stephen Schwartzman. Um, this was actually to establish a humanities center. Um, uh, but. Stephen Schwarzman had become very seized by talking to a lot of people in the tech area, in, particularly in the US, uh, around these very consequential decisions that were starting to emerge, that were ethical in nature, based on this new generation of AI. And I think you're right. I think a lot of this is because of the unreasonable effectiveness of certain types of uh, modern deep neural network or machine learning method. Now, what we know about those, of course, they have been around for, for decades uh, in some form, uh, neural network processing, but with increases in computational power and memory, we can now implement layer on layer of these neural networks, and they effectively compute these huge weight matrices, which take a set of inputs, whether they're images or documents, whatever that might be, and find the underlying patterns in them, often in ways that don't kind of reflect, as we used to find in our older expert systems, rule-based reasoning or logical theorems. Those systems still have a role and utility. In fact, they may be really important in making sense of these modern systems, but these modern systems aren't, aren't as you say, quite as scrutable, and that's a challenge. So we find ourselves with a challenge from the donor, which was, um, what could you do with uh, the idea of bringing um, a, a, a structure to Oxford that would answer those questions? And we were hugely helped by the fact that, well, philosophy is one of the biggest, it is perhaps the biggest department of philosophy in a university anywhere in the world, as far as I understand, and has this remarkable history of ethics research, a deep history. And with the emergence of AI and computer science, and the physical science and engineering and medical science at Oxford, we've got all of these uh, protagonists, these technical implementers with this deep potential history in philosophy. And so the, our natural thought in designing this was to locate the Institute within this extraordinarily rich history of, of philosophical inquiry. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what that, in, what that history is and why it is consequential? Yeah, so very good question. So it is the largest philosophy department in the English speaking world. Another important feature about philosophy in Oxford is that you cannot do as an undergraduate philosophy as a single honors degree. So there is a kind of built in assumption 
it's a kind of Aristotelian assumption, I think, that really to do proper philosophy, you can't simply do philosophy. It's really important to do it in tandem with another body of knowledge, which you have some kind of grasp. And you know, classic example of that emerging in Oxford is philosophy of law. And Oxford's this great center of philosophy of law, precisely because it was able to bridge these two disciplines in ways that other universities, which may have had very distinguished philosophy departments and very distinguished law schools, weren't able to do. So we have the advantage of philosophy being always a kind of interdisciplinary degree at undergraduate level, and we have the advantage of the college system. But basically the idea is, as ordinary human beings, we constantly engage in ethical discussions. I mean, ethics is first and foremost, a form of ordinary human thought that is unavoidable for us insofar as we have to make choices about how to live both as individuals and as communities. So ethics is not the monopoly of any particular discipline as such. It's part of the fabric of human life. However, it happens to be the case that there is one particular discipline that has a very, very rich history of engaging with these questions where people basically become specialists in thinking in a deep way about these questions. And that's the discipline of moral philosophy. So the way I would put it is as follows, that if we're trying to avoid a superficial intellectual engagement with the ethical questions around AI, then the depth has to come from somewhere. And the first place to look for, for that depth is moral philosophy, because you have there this rich tradition over many centuries of people trying to figure out the answer to the twin questions, what makes life worthwhile? What is it that I owe to other people, right? So that's really important. And we then build on that because I think what you wanna say is, look, it's not just philosophy that is concerned with that, even though philosophy has a particularly strong focus on these issues, other humanities disciplines are also concerned with these issues. That through the novel, for example, you may have your eyes open to what a flourishing life is in a way that might not be possible by reading a philosophical treatise. Similar points could be made about music, etc. So the next step is, this is why it's integrated into um, a humanity center, because we want the kind of philosophy we do to be enriched by the kind of self-understanding the humanities can generate. And I think one of the reasons this is important is because that kind of distinctive approach, what I'm gonna call the humanistic approach that philosophy and the humanities can generate, tends to be crowded out somewhat in this field because, this is my speculation, that if you are someone who is in this field primarily as, for example, a scientist, you might naturally be drawn to forms of ways of thinking about ethics that are quite formal, that are quite data-driven, that might, for example, prioritize things like, well, ethics is simply about collecting the data regarding people's preferences and then optimizing for those preferences. Now, I'm not, I don't think that's the correct way to approach ethics, but what I'm saying is if your methods, your intellectual methods are formal and quantitative, you might naturally be drawn to that approach to ethics. And I think what we need to do is ensure that people who find that sort of approach congenial, and it's not just scientists, it's in some ways deeply embedded in our culture now, that that's challenged and people who adopt that approach do so with the awareness that there is another way of thinking about these things and the need for a dialogue. So we want this to amplify the voice of the humanistic perspective that the humanities can afford. That will be the distinct value added of this institute. Great, and I remember uh, putting the proposal together and uh, so delighted that we were able to recruit you into the director role. But in putting the proposal together, we, we looked also back into um, areas like medical ethics where the, the presence of serious philosophical thinking there really advanced the subject and, and still does. I mean, the questions like futility of care or even defining what it is what death is, uh, or uh, the notion of how you allocate scarce resources, these are these required new ways of thinking, new concepts, which 
philosophers turn out to be really important uh, in, in that. Um, you expect to see that in AI? Exactly so. So I think um, there are two things, at least, that we can learn from the example of medical ethics. One is just look at the people who have been the really innovative people who've made important moves in that discipline. And people like Honora O'Neill, Mary Warnock, one thing you'll notice about them is that they did not simply focus on medical ethics to the exclusion of everything else. On the contrary, they were also dealing with more foundational questions, whether in moral philosophy generally or philosophy of mind, and that their engagement with these foundational questions is precisely what gave them the intellectual leverage uh, to be able to deal then with medical ethics. I think this is a really important lesson. And, you know, I think, you know, why it's important to, 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 to emphasize that because it is ultimately the source of the intellectual respectability of a field like medical ethics or AI ethics that it tracks back to these deeper concerns, that it's not operating at a kind of brittle superficial level but reaches into something deeper. So that's the first thing I would say, look at the big uh, figures in this area. They were people who had an expansive intellectual vision and came with that, mobilized that in dealing with medical ethics. And the other thing is that um, people in this area were able to maintain a high profile as philosophers, yet be engaged with public concerns be engaged with issues around law reform and so forth. So I think these are the examples we want to look to and try to emulate that you can do this in a way that is intellectually deep, but also publicly engaged. And one of the things I'm really pleased about is, you know, there are certain temptations in intellectual life. And one of them is to write things that only five other people in the world can understand. And you get a certain kind of ego boost from being part of this elite that can understand this and no one else can. I think we're increasingly realizing that in the kind of world we're living in now and the changes that are taking place, the political polarization that exists, that it's all the more incumbent upon academics to try to engage with the wider public, both in terms of trying to do the difficult thing of writing in a way that people who are not specialists can understand. They're intelligent, but they're not specialists in that particular area. But also I think another aspect of public engagement is actually learning from people's experiences. That's not a one-way process. Okay, yeah. So we've talked a little bit about the general, uh, the reason why philosophy is in this discussion, what it can bring to it, and uh, and, and and our raison d'etre for setting up the institute. Let's think about some specific examples because we've we've now got faculty appointed, great postdocs and PhD students in place, and and we've had invited speakers. And some of the topics we've been wrestling with, um, really, I mean, one already mentioned in the chat, the area of justice, the fact that people will be aware well, that they're not. It's a it's an extraordinary fact that increasingly algorithmic justice is being dispensed whether it's in setting bail in the us or indeed in even in sentencing what could you just unpack what the ethical dimensions for that are and how in the kind of discussions we've been having we've been trying to deal with different perspectives on whether actually machine justice is actually fairer or less biased than the, 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 the than a judge uh, after their heavy lunch. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Um, so this is um, a particular area of interest of mine because I am interested in things like the rule of law and legal adjudication and also justice, which I take to be the domain of rights. You know, So justice differs from the rest of morality in that it's about the rights that people have. And so if we think about the prospect of algorithmic decision-making like you know, Mr. Justice Robot, as it were, it really helps us to really question some of those values in a new kind of way. So if you ask people, well, would you like your case to be determined by an algorithm? Um, what is it that would be the qualms that they would express in that case? Um, and 
so one thought might be, well, surely an algorithm is gonna decide things in a kind of mechanical way, um, following the algorithm, the rule, but surely an ideal judge is someone who departs from the rule in cases where, for example, some kind of mercy is indicated, right? So one of the things you'd have to think about is, um, is adjudication just about justice in the sense of consistent application and impartial application of a given rule? And to what extent is that something that can be automated in any meaningful sense? But I think there's an even deeper question because, so as you know, uh, Nigel, we had um, Daniel Kahneman and Cass Sunstein talking about this idea of noise. And the idea of noise is precisely um, unwanted variability in judgments. And their paradigm example is the huge variability in judgments in similar cases made by different judges. Or as you say, even the same judge, depending on the state of his digestive system, whether he's had lunch or not, right? And so one of the ideas that's put forward by strong proponents of algorithmic decision-making is, well, look, it's not just bias that's a problem, um, where someone systematically errs in one direction, so they systematically give harsh punishments to people who are from a particular ethnic minority group or who are poor or what have you. That's one kind of human problem of judgment. Another problem of human judgment is just variability, depending on time of day or depending on which judge you happen to have or depending on whether their football team won, the outcome will differ. And then you present algorithmic decision-making, which by definition is noiseless as a kind of panacea. And so you say, well, look, whatever you think about mercy, surely a big part of justice ought to be the consistent and impartial application of rules. And there, I think you'd have to ask yourself the question, well, even if I could be assured that the law would be more strictly applied by an automated system than by a human. And if all I was thinking about was that leaving aside mercy, are there any reasons why I might still think something was missing in the automated case? And we've talked about one of them, which is explainability. But there is another one, which is accountability. The human decision maker can take responsibility for that decision. The person who sentenced me to prison can say, I have weighed up the considerations, I take responsibility for this judgment. Whereas in the case of any kind of automated system that we're aware of, however sophisticated, that kind of um, taking of responsibility isn't present. And so I, I, I give the example of a psychologist in um, London who was working with um, offenders and she presented them with this question. I mean, this was kind of an informal, um, situation, but she presented them with the question, would they prefer the AI uh, judge or a human judge if the AI judge is more consistent and impartial? And their answer was on the whole that they would prefer the human judge. And I think this idea that we want to live in a society where consequential decisions are made by those who can take responsibility for them, that that's a way of acknowledging our dignity I think that's an important consideration. It's not determinative, but it's really important. Yeah, I think that's that's a, a really interesting uh, uh, lens to put on this. And of course, uh, um, these justice application contexts are going to be legion. One can imagine that it'll be all too easy to throw algorithms at, at, at routine uh, uh, petty infringements and, and how we have redress and accountability back to, uh, to, to to humans who have a rather broader social embedding is a really good question. There's okay. another thing, sorry, there's another thing that's often referenced in the ethical debate, of course, which is the, you talk about dignity and autonomy, but of course, one of the other, um, you know, kind of uh, post enlightenment principles that came through was the notion of privacy, you know, uh, the right to be left alone, um, the right to uh, one's own private life, and indeed control perhaps over the data you generate is where it's now uh, uh, contemporarily uh, discussed. 
if we have a question, and I think there is a question I just noticed in the chat close in on this, take, take a health context, which is uh, that public health context of rights to my data and broader public goods in having access to that or uh, AI systems which are able to link data at very large scale to find patterns of uh, comorbidities or susceptibilities. Um, where does the where does the where does where does the ethics help us in these kinds of contexts? Kind of the, the 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 privacy as a right versus kind of adjustable regimes that are in some sense more context aware. It's a really really difficult question. I think this question actually points up a wider problem that we have that we haven't really addressed, which is we still tend to oscillate between a kind of individualistic approach to ethics that puts a great deal of emphasis on rights. But on the other hand, we also move towards notions of collective good or public goods. And we haven't really come up with an adequate framework for integrating these two things. And one classic example of that is our response to the pandemic, where you want to say, look, well, there's kind of public good in, 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 su in su suppressing COVID. But on the other hand, what if the means of suppressing COVID actually involve infringements upon liberty? Um, for me, this is one of the most profound issues in ethics and something that I've you know, tried to grapple with. It's very, very difficult. I think the starting point has to be, um, and this is by no means the end of the story, but the starting point has to be, when we talk about privacy, we too readily move from saying, this bears on my privacy or affects my privacy interest to this is an infringement of my right to privacy. And I think we could, we need to resist that. We need to resist that because not everything that bears on my privacy is necessarily an infringement of my right to privacy. My right to privacy is protected by a duty, but in order for my right, for my right to privacy to be protected by a duty, then I've got to factor in issues of cost, for example. And so to go back to the COVID example of liberty, um, does my right to liberty include being able to freely move about and put others at risk of catching COVID or harming them in various other ways? No, I may have an interest in doing that, but I don't have a right in that. Others aren't under an obligation to allow me to do that. So what we need to think about now is given the potential, and I say potential, because I think a lot of this hasn't been fully realized, but given the potential of big data and AI to make big advances in public health, we have to ask ourselves then, how do we now configure the right to privacy, right? Rights have to evolve as society evolves, as technological capabilities evolve. You know, there would have been a time in human history when we couldn't say necessarily that people had a right to an adequate standard of living because there was no way to configure society in such a way that this could be delivered to them. And there's no point in saying people have the right to something which it's impossible to deliver. Well, now that we potentially have technologies that by operating on vast stores of big data, big data they could advance public health, then we have to reconfigure what the right to privacy is in that context and part of the answer could be that certain things that look like intrusions into privacy may be justified, may not be rights violations in certain kinds of societies, in particular democratic societies that afford certain kinds of protections. But Nigel, you're the one who's done a lot of work in this regard in terms of how it is we can safeguard privacy whilst reaping the benefits of these new approaches. Yeah, and I think it's uh, it's uh, there's a whole class of technologies, so-called privacy-enhancing technologies, which uh, address some of these issues. Partly because as we rely more and more on large-scale machine learning to derive insights, uh, as you federate that data together, you're in danger of revealing patterns which you might not have imagined at all were available in the data. Many examples of that. So I think I think I think that uh, what we what we do need as we develop these techniques and methods is that interrogation from the philosophical point of view that that, that helps us understand where the norms might sit, where where 
in some sense, conventions might play a role, but where actually in some cases, regulation is the proper way to think about this. You know, when when do you begin to reach out uh, and 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 uh, and feel the need for for legal redress in some sense or legal protections? And I think that uh, again brings us to to interesting questions about the uh, about the. Uh, uh, the evolution of our subject. I'm going to spend a little bit of time perhaps looking a little bit forward, but also address something that's come up in the question channel, which is AI is full of computer scientists and not just computer scientists, lots of numerate uh, 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 engineers from all sorts of other disciplines who uh, don't work under a professional code like the, uh, the medical profession. They're not licensed generally to uh, to, to practice, and yet um, <laughs> their systems are consequential. Uh, there, there are really quite interesting issues about liability, um, and there are quite in is interesting issues about um, a, uh, a profession understanding that it has particular obligations. I should say I, I'm seeing amongst my own students huge appetite and interest in these ethical uh, questions and in the whole notion of AI for good. I mean, it's quite it's quite notable. But um, there's a whole piece in this around professional regulation and uh, and well organized um, uh, legal bodies of work that relate to professional institutions and individuals as professionals. Do you have a sense on on whether we need to be uh, thinking about that in uh, um, as, as, as as you look at us engineers and scientists building this stuff? I think absolutely we do need to think about that, and I think the thing that you just described about younger computer scientists seeing this as part of their discipline, I think that's really crucial. That there isn't this sort of hiving off of the ethical as somehow belonging to a different discipline. The ethical pervades everything because the ethical is about ultimately what reasons we have for doing what we do, including, for example, conducting research in computer science and AI. So that has been a really encouraging um, development. And, you know, we are sort of at Oxford, you know, offering, I've got a colleague, Milo Phillips Brown, who's a fellow at Jesus, who is offering bespoke ethical courses for computer scientists. Now, this is really vital um, because he's not saying go read Immanuel Kant and then apply the categorical imperative to what you're doing. That's the lazy way out. The, the difficult path is to think, okay, this is this great heritage of philosophical thinking. How can I draw on this that speaks to the problems that these students are having to grapple with in their discipline. That's extremely hard, but also incredibly rewarding. And one of the things I found um, extremely um, rewarding in coming to Oxford is the wonderful conversations we're having across the disciplines. And in particular, the highly motivated people in computer science who clearly have already taken ethics very seriously want to engage in these discussions. My only regret is uh, in-person interaction has been limited by the pandemic, you know, because you do need that in-person interaction because when you're operating across disciplines, you need the facility to ask, as it were, stupid questions based on ignorance. And it's very hard to do that via Zoom, you know, whereas in person, person you can do that. So I totally agree with that, Nigel. I think the other thing I would say is not only um, bringing professionals into a kind of explicit and reflective ethical domain where they have to think through the ethics of what they're doing. I think this has to be widened to include the broader community. Um, and I think that's because it's essential to, you know, political scientists will say something that is, um, you know, quite shocking maybe to lawyers, but they will say that the best institutional safeguard for rights is actually democracy whereas often we're taught to think of rights and democracy as somehow loggerheads and rights are these um, restraints on majoritarian decision making so we don't just need an enlightened um, professional class dealing with these issues we also need an enlightened citizenry and again one of my greatest hopes for the institute is that we can actually 
generate a discussion in which ordinary people, by which I mean people in their capacity not as experts, can engage with these sorts of questions in a civil and rational way. Yes, and actually, um, um, it's interesting how we are we are absolutely in the moment here. And these systems are presenting ethical challenges quite apart from whatever um, the prospects for artificial general intelligence. And I, I think I'm on record as being quite skeptical of that for quite some time to come. Um, but there are these real issues uh, right now. I mean, there are worries around the use of um, recommender algorithms, uh, in some sense, AI driven algorithms that that shape, in some sense, uh, people's information consumption, the whole issue around supporting democratic institutions. And um, when, when you look at that, I know you've got a particular interest around um, how we sustain and support democracy. Uh, do you see that the um, one problem we have, I think, is that the we have very little available access to what those recommender algorithms are and how they actually work in many of these platforms that seem to be in some sense, for, in some people's minds anyway, uh, um, um, uh, you know, kind of promoting and making uh, aggravating notions of polarization. Yeah, I think this is very important. I mean, there are at least two worries here. One is the atrophying of our capacity for rational choice because we become, as it were, addicted or overly reliant on recommender systems, as it were, to make our choices for us. Now, this is not unique to them because this is a common feature of human life that a lot of people do become, um, don't exercise their rational autonomy sufficiently. They do sort of follow the crowd or follow you know, some particular authority in their lives when they ought to be deciding for themselves. But the problem is that these recommender systems are so pervasive <laughs> in terms of the world we now live in, and they're in a sense personalized to data about you, that the, the risk to one's autonomy um, becomes very grave. And that's a problem in terms of living a flourishing life, but it's also a problem in terms of contributing as a democratic citizen to sound public decision-making. So I think that is a real issue, but there's a flip side, I think, which is, you know, we have a colleague um, visiting the next six months, Helen Landmore from Yale, and she's very interested in the flip side of this, the way in which AI might, as a technology, facilitate more radical participatory forms of democracy. So it's the picture isn't entirely bleak, that, you know, there are a lot of people now who have the view, look, we're too focused on a represent a class of professional politicians representing us in democratic decision making. And this has led to a lot of alienation, people feeling they've lost the voice, that these representatives don't truly represent them. Well, what about ways in which we can get ordinary citizens more engaged in deliberation and decision making? And the classic problem here has been, well, they won't have the time. Um, how can you operate democracy at this scale? Maybe AI can offer some solutions in that respect. Maybe it can help sort of facilitate civil, meaningful conversations by being a kind of convening uh, technology where citizens get together and things are structured by a certain kind of AI environment. Um, or it can be a way of summarizing information for people at a much faster rate and less expensively than would be the case without AI. So I think this is another interesting feature that we mustn't sort of assume that this technology necessarily has nefarious purposes built into it. It's down to us. Okay, look, I'm gonna, there are just lots of really interesting questions in the chat already. So I'm got, we're gonna open it up. I've, I've been trying to weave a few of them in, but uh, there are just, uh, there's some really excellent questions. I'm gonna just perhaps take one, which I think is, is probably uh, um, not entirely unexpected. Is this concern around weaponization of AI, which uh, uh, we know use of drone technology, uh, taking humans out the kill loop, uh, terrible phrases, but I mean, it, it's, uh, it's uh, um, how should we be looking at the ethics and control of of, of of these weapons? What does the what does the 
what does the perspective tell us uh, where these dual use technologies have come to be an issue for us? Uh, what's the philosophical um, view on that? Well, I, I have just my view. There are a lot of different philosophers have different views, but can I ask you a preliminary question about that, Nigel? How far advanced do you think this technology is? I mean, to what extent are we talking here about hypothetical situations and to what extent are we talking well I, th I think I think there's a really interesting uh, question about how restrained uh, various uh, uh, states with this capability are prepared to be I think it's undoubtedly the case that these systems are already although a lot of them are essentially um, um, uh, pilotless but nevertheless under human control um, there is a huge amount of algorithmic decision making I mean, there is in any modern weapon system just to keep you out of harm's way. You know, systems are kind of uh, um, um, looking at the uh, the threat landscape and adjusting, firing off all sorts of ordnances and munitions. I mean, the question is, at what point you have uh, you believe that the uh, object recognition systems are sufficient that uh, you can take and an, an decision cycle so fast you can take the human out of the loop, or you feel you have to because of pressure of time. And I think that. Yeah, in truth, those capabilities are are with us. Uh, it's whether that we choose to switch them on and suffer undoubtedly the collateral damage that might result because they will not be perfect. Yeah, so I think there are two things there. So one thing is that they will, if they're not perfect, then you sort of wind up with a situation of some kind of massive conflagration arising because of error. Uh, but another, there's another issue, which is a lot of people will have qualms about the thought that a life and death decision is made by a machine. So they will say, independently of whether or not some catastrophic error is on the cards, there's something deeply wrong about someone's life being terminated because, as it were, an autonomous machine made this decision. So this goes back to a kind of fascinating question to what extent do we have a right to a human decision? And some people think this is a kind of paradigm case. Mm. But I think there's another issue here, which is this now confronts us in a very profound way with the geopolitical nature of some of these issues. That in a way, this issue around autonomous weapon systems cannot be fully solved by any one country because there's always gonna be a kind of incentive to keep developing this sort of weaponry as long as you suspect that other countries are doing so. So I think, you know, we need to bring in, you know, think about how um, nuclear weapons were brought under some kind of control and to what extent this can be extended to autonomous weapon systems with the added problem that verifiability is probably a lot easier with nuclear weapons than it is with autonomous weapon systems. Yes, and in fact, and the point is made actually by, by Karis McCulloch, yeah, you know, that actually, of course, you know, landmines uh, don't, you don't have been an algorithm to indiscriminately uh, um, wreck havoc. And I suspect that's one of the reasons that there have been uh, attempts to, uh, to at least curb proliferation of these types of, of, of weapons. Yeah. Okay. Um, and again, I just looking at uh, some of the chat, there's an interesting question here about um, the, 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 the financial sector. I mean, the application of uh, AI in consequential areas of financial decision making fintech very advanced area in some respects uh, and the question uh, is essentially around um, if you, the use of AI in financial services and the financial markets how do we resolve the use of AI to make financial decisions it's impossible for a robo is it impossible for a robo advisor to ever give incorrect financial advice according to regulatory agendas I suppose it's back to that question of of accountability again, perhaps partly, but... Uh... Is it possible for a robot advisor to give incorrect advice? Um, yeah, well, that, that's a good question. Um, th there are two questions. Well, I don't see why it wouldn't be possible to, for it to give incorrect advice, given that anything, um, anything created by humans is fallible. So one thing is about the quality of the advice. The other thing is the source of that advice and whether someone can take responsibility for that advice and be held accountable. Both of those things are really important. But you know, this really brings us to the point that the values in play and how they play out really will vary from case to case. You know? So this is why it's important for the way we approach these issues 
there isn't going to be a kind of, I don't think a master template that resolves them, you know. I think we have to think about what are the values at stake in each of these different domains. And FinTech is involved with finance. It's not in the same way, for example, a life and death issue in the way that autonomous weapons are. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and a point made early in the conversation, but a really interesting one is that um, a lot, a lot, a lot of concern must vest on um, who actually writes the algorithm. Is it collective, individual? Where does the data come from? Issue around the bias you might find in the underlying data used to train a uh, um, uh, in a machine learning context, train an algorithm. Now, um, these these have been quite well researched. I mean, it's a very intense area of reflection. But um, the questions of equity and, and, and confidence in whether you have actually, in some sense, just compiled in various forms of bias, that's something, again, we've talked about. Um, what does the philosopher bring to that? What does our analysis bring to those kinds of contexts? Well, you know, I think the question of who decides is really important. And I think what I would say, and this is, you know, something philosophers have to hold their hands up to some extent, We've kind of neglected the topic of democracy for quite a long time. It hadn't been at the forefront. I mean, when I used to teach um, theory of politics in Oxford between uh, 1998 and 2010, when I was a fellow at Corpus, I taught that paper, hardly ever did we cover democracy as a separate topic. And it's interesting to speculate now why that was, but instead we thought more about well, democracy is something we take for granted. It's, it's basically an institutional mechanism. We were more interested in values like the real meaning of justice or the real meaning of equality. But I think what has become increasingly apparent is we've taken for granted a mechanism that is incredibly important in realizing those other values. So I think the question about who decides there are micro versions of that question, but at the macro level, I think what really we need to do is have a situation where there is an informed democratic citizenry that is able to decide after due deliberation on these matters. And I think this is what we're not seeing. I think we're seeing too many aspects of life being parceled out to experts who make expert decisions without necessarily having the input of the wider citizenry. So my, um, one of my favorite quotes from Aristotle, um, who I notice I've been mentioning quite a lot, uh, <laughs> um, is where he says, sometimes the person who lives in the house knows more about it than the architect who designed it. And I think that's a very important reason for democratic input, because often those who are in a decision-making class who have certain kinds of technical knowledge don't have the full knowledge that comes from being a citizen subject to certain kinds of, um, for example, discrimination or bias as a result of these technologies. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a there's a question following up on the on, on the issue of privacy. Um, one is, you know, are we in some sense on a slippery slope here? Um, uh, irreversible deprecation of privacy with people unknowingly trading their privacy to social media companies uh, that hire. Uh, social psychologists to make their platform semi-addictive. It's called persuasive design. I mean, that's what the kind of uh, technology is. And, it, and it's particularly invidious when it comes to uh, things like children and the clickbait that gets put up there. But I mean, this idea that somehow we reveal quite a lot of ourselves in the in our interaction with these systems. And, and, and is that irrecoverable in a certain sense? And uh, and how do we deal with the fact that the rules on that may vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction? I mean, how do we, how do we, yeah. Yeah, well, that's, I think this is a beautiful question. And what it points up is that the limitations of talking simply about a right to privacy, because usually with the right to privacy, we're talking about other people's duties not to infringe um, your privacy, but we don't have rights against ourselves. So what the questioner is pointing out, I think here is that, we need to have a very expansive ethical framework. So when we think about privacy, we're not simply thinking about people's rights to privacy because others may infringe their privacy. We're also thinking about issues like, as it were, duties to oneself. What is the right attitude I should have towards my own personal information? 
Should I be making these disclosures? Maybe I've got a right to make these disclosures. In fact, often rights protect us in doing things that are wrong, right? Like engaging in stupid or silly speech. We shouldn't do that, but we have a right to do it. And I think the question is, um, point is really quite powerful that a really rich ethical framework would start asking questions like, never mind what rights you have to privacy, what about duties? Such that you don't engage in kind of self-disclosure. And then another question, shouldn't I help that person be the sort of person who is able to sort of comply with the duties to themselves, not to ruin their lives as a young person, for example, by putting everything online and then it becomes irretrievable. And I think similarly, we can, we can talk about this. We talk about rights to free speech, but there are also other norms around speech about sort of, you know, Nora O'Neill has emphasized honesty and um, civility that, Perhaps others don't have a right that I give an honest answer or that I treat them civilly, but nonetheless, part of an ecology of an ecological, uh, sort of ethical ecology would include certain ideals or considerations about how one speaks over and above, are you respecting rights to freedom of speech? This is really important. And it's basically saying, look, it's not simply about rights people have, it's about becoming a certain kind of person cultivating certain virtues. And I think we're squeamish about that because we think that might be overly intrusive, but maybe one of the things we've come to learn in this rather difficult last decade is actually maybe democracy does require cultivating virtues. It has to go beyond simply saying, well, I'm respecting people's rights, so I'm doing the right thing. That's very interesting, yeah. And, 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 and to promote what that would mean to uh, try and build civil discourse. And uh, 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 those are just as important, are important underpinnings to our, our, our approach to these challenges. Uh, a, a lot of, uh, um, a lot of uh, um, our attendees may have listened to the recent Reith lectures by Stuart Russell, we have very accessible lectures. And, and, and Stuart, I mean, huge uh, history and background in this, but he seemed to be advocating for uh, a form of a kind of um, utilitarianism, which was, uh, it's about optimizing for the right things, but it is about optimization. And that's, that can work in a lot of contexts, but what, what do you feel about that view uh, that if we attend to maximizing, you know, some uh, utility preference, that will get us a long way? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm skeptical about that view, but it sort of harks back to the point I was making earlier, that if you're, um, intellectual strength is with formal systems and with quantification, then you're liable to see ethics in those terms as well. So my, I guess my point would be, the most basic point I would make is, ethics, a true ethics cannot take people's preferences as given. The preferences may be ill-informed, they may be biased in various ways, they may reflect various kinds of prejudices or adaptations to oppressive environments where these people find themselves in. So the first question in ethics cannot be, how do I figure out people's preferences and maximize them? It really is the question, what are the preferences I ought to have, right? And so that's the question about, well, what truly makes for a good life, which may be very different from the kind of life I find myself wanting. And the question, how do I properly respect other people who are also in the business of trying to lead a good life? So I think this is the difficulty and it also plays into issues about, as it were, crowdsourcing ethics. I think similar issues there. It might be interesting to crowdsource in various ways as a kind of point of information. And it might be interesting to crowdsource as a form of political decision-making but it can't be that you crowdsource to find out what ethics is, right? Yeah, that's something, great, that's great. There's something deeper. Yeah, well, that's probably, a, we're almost, it's the top of the hour. Uh, that's an hour that's flown by. Um, and uh, I just draw, draw this to a conclusion and, and uh, say, I just really enjoyed the conversation. Perhaps just a final point, very briefly. What, what's your ambition? What, do you, what does success look like for you with the Institute and with the programme? in the next few years? 
Ooh, I think what I want to do is build up a really powerful intellectual culture, people from different disciplines engaging with these sorts of questions. Um, I think we need to build up that critical mass. We're in the process of doing that. And then ideally, given the situation we are in now, as it were politically in the Western world, I would love to, to see that this is having an impact, not just in the academy, but a beneficial impact in terms of raising the quality of discussion around these sorts of questions in, in the community more generally. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, John. Uh, I don't know whether uh, Brittany is going to close this out. Uh, I'll give her that opportunity. And uh, uh, but it's been a great conversation. Brittany, uh, do you want to just uh, uh, close this out? Thank you so much. It's actually uh, my colleague Peter is going to come on and talk okay. about forthcoming okay. events. And thank okay. you thank so you. much again. Yeah, thank, thank you both so much. Thank you so much, Nigel and John, for that fascinating discussion. Uh, just to let you know that you can now book for the next part of this series on our website. It's going to be the future of regenerative medicine with Professors Gail Colander, Paul Riley, and Shankar Srinvaras, which is going to be on Thursday, the 10th of February, at the same time, six or seven. And you'll also receive an email with the booking link tomorrow. But until then, thank you so much for joining us and good night. <laughs>